here. Wade anyway, against Mo Williams. Look out! Oh my! Playing Wade with a crusher. Swatted away from behind. Wade kicks it out to Boss. Rolls it down and a foul. Here he comes, hitting ahead for Wade. There he goes. Oh! The house of highlights! Not two, not three. Super teams. Not four, not five. Player empowerment. Not six, not seven. Pace and space. These terms are part of the NBA's everyday lexicon now, but we can trace their origins back to one moment, one team, and one unforgettable collection of superstar talent. LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh only spent four years together. But those four years changed the league and the sports world forever. The game looks different. The spectacle of free agency is magnified. And teams are under relentless pressure to keep stars happy. This is the story behind the Big Three era Miami Heat. After James Wade and Bosch helped lead the 2008 US Olympic team, nicknamed the Redeem Team, to glory, rumors began circulating that the trio of perennial all-stars had hatched the plan to eventually join forces stateside. With all three on track to test free agency in the summer of 2010, teams were already bending over backwards to carve out and maintain 2010 cap space. The mere thought that two of the three, let alone all three, could be had as a package deal only fueled the cap space fee. In addition to Miami, the Knicks, Nets, Bulls, and Clippers were among the teams positioning themselves for a free agency coup. In Toronto, it was obvious Bosch's tenure north of the border was on thin ice, as splashy deals for Jermaine O'Neal, then Sean Marion, and eventually Hito Turkoglu had left the Raptors on a mediocre treadmill to nowhere. A facial injury to Bosch in the final weeks of the 2009-2010 season derailed a playoff push and served as the death knell for the Raps. In Cleveland, James had just finished carrying a comically bad supporting cast to the best record in the league for the second straight season. But his Cavs crashed out in the second round, and the perception was that a banged up LeBron had dogged it down the stretch of a physically taxing series against Boston. And Cleveland fans wondering if that's the last time he'll take off a Cavalier jersey. There were also rumors of some uh, behind the scenes stuff going on. In Miami, Wade was playing the best ball of his career for a grimy but solidly unspectacular team that hadn't won a single playoff series in the four years since winning the 2006 championship. Between the 2010 draft and the start of free agency, the Heat traded Daquan Cook and the pick that became Eric Bledsoe for a second rounder, traded Michael Beasley for a couple second rounders, renounced all their free agents, and bought out James Jones in an agreement that saw the veterans sacrifice a million dollars. This left the Heat with only a couple of guaranteed salaries on their cap sheet, and opened up the potential to add two max level free agents while retaining Wade. Over the first week of July, LeBron listened to pitches from pretenders trying to capitalize on his love of TV, Pat Riley, meanwhile, dumped his collection of championship rings on the table. Then this happened. Dwayne and Chris, Dwayne, we'll start with you. Where are you going to be playing next season? <laughs> well, I'm back in Miami, man. I'm back in, um, if, as now, as for now, I'm back in Wade County. Back in Miami with the Heat. Chris, you want to jump in and tell us where you're going to be as well? Yeah, I'm joining Mr. Wade in Miami. Days later, LeBron was asked and answered the most important basketball question ever asked of him. You still a nail biter? Uh, I have a little bit, not, not of late. No, wait, that's not the right clip. LeBron, what's your decision? Um, in this fall, man, it's, it's, it's very tough. Um, in this fall, I'm going to take my talents to South Beach and um, join the Miami Heat. That answer, that decision, reverberated around the sports world. I hope he never wins anything in Miami. Was this he is dead to me. I'm a big LeBron fan, and this is the worst thing that could have ever happened to me. It's easy to forget now, as we remember the money LeBron's televised decision raised for the Boys and Girls Club, 
and reflect on how that moment empowered future generations of athletes to take control of their own careers. But James and his new teammates were absolutely lambasted for that moment. It probably didn't help that the Heat held a championship-like rally to celebrate its new Big Three before they had even played a game. Yes, we did! Yes, we did! It should be noted, though, that all three stars took less than the full max to accommodate not just each other, but veterans like Jones, Udonis Haslam, and Mike Miller. The Big Three's first season together began with some bumps in the road and some bumps on the bench. The Heat started that 2010-11 season a pedestrian 9-8, and eight, which led to James famously asking Riley if he ever gets the itch to coach again. Wink, wink. But Riley would hear none of it. LeBron and Eric Spolstra would learn to appreciate each other's dedication to their crafts, the Big Three began to gel, and Miami followed up that 9-8 and eight start with 21 wins in their next 22 games which included an emotional victory in LeBron's toxic return to Cleveland. The Heat finished that season 58-24, before storming through the East playoffs with a 12-3 record. Three on two for the Heat. Oh, James behind the back and finds Wade. What a move by LeBron James. Even the top-seeded 62-win Bulls led by MVP Derrick Rose were no match for Miami. The good times continued to roll right into the finals, as Miami won Game 1 against an overmatched Mavs team and had a 15-point lead in Game 2 with just 6.5 minutes left. But it was all downhill from there, as Dirk capped a 22-5 Mavs run with the Game 2 winner in the closing seconds. Novitski drives with the underneath lefty layup, banks it in with 3.6 remaining. Miami out of timeouts, trailing by two. James back to Wade. Wade puts it up for the win. Off the mark, and Dallas has tied the finals with one of the most incredible comebacks in NBA Finals history. The Heat reclaimed the series lead in Game 3, but it would prove to be the team's final victory of the season. Miami blew another lead in Game 4, while Game 5 will always be remembered as the night Wade and James mocked the fact Dirk was battling an illness during the series. Oh, did y'all hear me cough? I think I'm sick. <laughs> <laughs> Only to get shown up by the legendary big man on the court. The series as a whole is the one true stain on LeBron's legacy, as one of the two greatest players ever couldn't solve Dallas' zone defense, or J.J. Barea in the post. When the Heat eventually wilted facing elimination in Game 6, and critics took their victory laps, LeBron said this. All the people that was rooting on me to fail, um, you know, at the end of the day, they got to wake up tomorrow, have the same life that they had um, before they woke up today. You know, they got the same personal problems that they had today. Suffice to say, no one would be rooting for Heat redemption the following year. But that low point versus Dallas forced the Heat to confront reality. And it was during year two together that Wade relinquished full control to James, who took home his third MVP award. What followed was a 46-20 record in a lockout-shortened season, but a more challenging postseason than the previous year, as an abdominal injury sidelined Bosch for most of a second-round series versus Indiana and the East Finals versus Boston. It was during that matchup with the Celtics, with the Heat down three games to two, facing elimination in Boston, and the vultures circling, that LeBron officially made the Heat his team. You know the game. You know the performance. It's the one that can be told with just one image. This look. Turns, little jump hook won't go. James comes flying in and throws it down. 45 points on 73% shooting, 15 rebounds, and five assists from James later, the Heat had forced the game seven back in Miami, which they won to clinch their second straight conference title. James fires a three. Bang! Wade, tough shot, draws the foul. It's good and one. LeBron James and the Heat's dreams of a championship still very much alive. Rather than a veteran team awaiting them in the finals this time, James Wade, Bosch and company drew the loaded young Thunder led by Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, James Harden, and Serge Ibaka. This time, it was the Heat dropping the series opener before storming back, 
as after a game one win, the youthful Thunder didn't know what hit them. Tries a three. Bang! LeBron James from downtown! Miami won three straight close games before blowing the doors off the Thunder in the Game 5 clincher. 2011 had such a bitter ending, making this celebration all that much sweeter. The Heat were champions, LeBron had finally reached the summit, adding a championship and a finals MVP award to his collection, and Bosch memorably did this. But the MVP is handed to him by Bill Russell, let's go to Doris first, and it's Scott Brooks. It was a far cry from a year earlier, when the big man slumped to the floor in tears after a finals loss. If year two was the season that the big three Heat got over the hump, year three was the season they tapped into the full potential of their greatness. In what would cause a rift with his former Celtics teammates that still exists to this day, Ray Allen joined the Heat in 2012 free agency giving these star-studded defending champions another shooter. With the size, length, and athleticism to wreak havoc on the defensive end, and a ton of shooting around some of the best shot creators to ever play the game, Spolstra's Heat truly leaned into their pace and space identity during that third season. The Heat actually played some of the slowest ball in the league at the time. Their pace component was more about taking advantage of transition opportunities than it was about playing fast. Who could forget that one of the most defining images of the Big Three Heat came on one of those transition opportunities a couple years earlier? Touch, but it goes to Wade. He has a Royal in front. On a bounce to James. Simply put, the 2012-13 Heat played some of the best basketball we'll ever see, posting a record of 66 and 16, which was fueled by the second longest winning streak in NBA history. Bosch came into his own as an elite two-way small ball center. Wade was an all-NBA player for the final time. And James was at his absolute apex. A fully formed basketball machine with no weaknesses left to exploit. Wade from behind takes it away. Chalmers, holds. James! Whoa! James took home his second straight MVP award in the 2012-2013 season averaging 26.8 points, 8 rebounds, 7.3 assists, and 1.7 steals while shooting 60% from two-point range and 40% from deep, and playing perhaps the best defense of his career. It seemed preposterous that any team could beat the Heat, which is why it was so stunning to see Indiana push Miami to seven games in the East Finals, and for the Spurs to have the Heat on the ropes, figuratively and literally, in Game 6 of the NBA Finals. We all know what happened next, as the Heat turned a 5-point deficit in the final 20 seconds into a tie game, thanks to a LeBron 3, a missed Kawhi Leonard free throw, and the most clutch offensive rebound plus 3-pointer ever. James catches, puts up the 3, won't go, rebound box, back out to Allen, his 3-pointer, bang! Tie game with 5 seconds remaining! The Heat survived a tight overtime by three measly points to force Game 7 a couple nights later, then got a combined 60 points and 22 rebounds from James and Wade to put the Spurs away from Miami's second straight title. James pulls up, puts it in, four-point lead! 35 for LeBron James! While most remember the 2015 Warriors as the first jump shooting team to prove you can shoot your way to a championship, remember that the 2013 Heat were an innovative shooting team in their own right, who further downsized in the finals when Spolstro replaced Udonis Haslam with Mike Miller in the starting five. The Heat were never again as inevitable as they were in 2013. They looked beatable all year en route to 54 wins in 2013-14, as Wade began to show signs he had lost a step the opt-out clauses of all three stars hung over the season, and rumors began to circulate that James had his eye on an Ohio homecoming after four years in Miami, the basketball equivalent of his college years away from home. Miami cruised through the East playoffs again with only three losses, but anyone hoping for an encore of the 2013 Finals Classic between the Heat and Spurs would soon be disappointed. Miami ran into a San Antonio buzzsaw, a dizzying array of ball movement, shooting, and cutting that sliced the Heat up in short order. The Spurs won the series in five games, outscoring the Heat by 70 points along the way. 
LeBron averaged 28 points on 57% shooting in the series, a one-man show trying to keep up with San Antonio's harmonic symphony. James had arrived in Miami four years earlier seeking the help needed to push him over the top. Now he was back to not getting enough support against a superior opponent on the biggest stage. The writing was on the wall. Four years after Riley's rings and Godfather offer had hypnotized LeBron, the legendary coach and executive couldn't even hold James's attention in a 2014 free agency meeting. Riley had inadvertently helped James usher in the era of player empowerment. Now he was falling victim to it. Just as the Heat had become LeBron's team during the Kings' time in Miami, so too did the NBA become LeBron's league. James returned to Cleveland, and though Wade and Bosch re-signed with the Heat, the franchise would revert into the shadows. By the time Miami returned to the finals again in 2020, James was leading the Lakers past the Heat for his fourth championship with his third different team, Wade was a broadcaster, and Bosch was more than four years removed from his last game due to issues with blood clots. So more than a decade since their assembly, how do we remember the James Wade Bosch led Heat? They weren't the first big three, but they were the most scrutinized. LeBron wasn't the first GOAT level talent to be surrounded by star teammates, but he went about finding those teammates in an unprecedented way. Spolstra's big three weren't the first team to play small or to prioritize spacing, but they did it better than any team up to that point ever had. And yes, they only won two championships in four years after promising more than a handful. Hell, they might have walked away with only one if Greg Popovich had Tim Duncan on the court to grab a defensive rebound at the end of regulation in Game 6 of the 2013 Finals. But the trio combined for 12 All-Star selections in four years together, won nearly 72% of their regular season games, went 59-27 and 27 in the playoffs, never fell short of the finals, and were must-watch TV regardless of whether you admired or loathed what they represented. Their greatness, their dominance, and their impact on the game, both on and off the court, should never be discounted. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video and want to see more content like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button.